Zipper rolls out to the right, pitches off to Taylor, and Taylor's to the 20. Down to the 15, down to the 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Touchdown, Billy Taylor! Billy Taylor scored a touchdown from 21 yards out. The crowd goes berserk. It was November 22nd, 1969 that they came to Barry, Michigan, all dressed in maize and blue. The words were said, the prayers were read, and everybody cried. But when they closed the coffin, there was someone else inside. Oh, they came to Barry, Michigan, but Michigan wasn't dead. And when the game was over, it was someone else instead. Eleven Michigan Wolverines put on the gloves of gray, and as the organ played the victors, they laid Woody Hayes away. Under center is Wangler at the 45. He goes back. He's looking for a receiver. He throws downfield to fire. Who's got it better than us? Nobody! Welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue, and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. It has been an interesting week on the Michigan football beat, and joining us with his thoughts today will be Nick Baumgartner from The Athletic. First, my view from Section 17 to get us started. I was hoping Nick and I would be previewing the Iowa game on this week's show, but as we are well aware, the game has been canceled and we know why. National Signing Day was Wednesday, and it went much better than many of us thought it would. Only two defections and 20 players signed letters of intent. We still have until February to add additional commits or even save scholarships for players in the portal or graduate transfers. As of now, this class is rated anywhere from 10 to 15 by various recruiting analysts. So not bad considering the drama surrounding the program. That drama is the contract talks to extend Jim's deal Or maybe not. We have no idea at this point. Now that the season is officially over, Jim and Ward should be able to find time to finalize a deal or part ways. No one knows how this process will end up. But hopefully, there will be a speedy conclusion. My guest today says if Jim stays or if there is a new coach, the issues remain the same. Michigan football needs a reboot. From recruiting to personnel to attitude and much more, this program needs a fix, and urgently. Here to discuss that and more this week is Nick Baumgartner from The Athletic. So stay with us. Here with us on our Michigan Game Day segment is Nick Baumgartner from The Athletic, and there is quite a bit to talk about, so welcome back to the show, Nick. Good to be here, Mike, always. Well, for starters, as we were setting this interview up earlier this week, I thought you and I would be previewing a game this Saturday night against Iowa, but as we all know now, it was canceled, and some fans might say, you know, hey, good, it's over with, others are going to be disappointed. Either way, it sure was not much of a surprise, was it, Nick? No, no. That you know, Michigan had had issues with um, COVID, as we know, for the last several weeks. Um, and you know what happens there is, and obviously, I you know, Michigan sent out their um, their numbers uh, week to week, and it hasn't always been easy to read in terms of uh, you know. I think they're trying to protect privacy situations, everything else. I don't know how it all goes, but you know, those numbers have built. Uh, quarantine situations have happened. Contact tracing has had to be a factor and what I was told was when they got back to practice on Sunday, which I'm not even sure if it was a full padded practice, um, they had fewer than 40 guys available 
And similar to the week before, they tried to start the week um, with really low numbers. And, you know, I'm not sure how much better or worse it got, but Ward Manuel said in the end that they would have had more than 50 out um, for that game. So, no, it just didn't – even last week when they canceled the Ohio State game and they talked about how they were optimistic, I mean, they may have been optimistic for the sake of being optimistic. In terms of reality with the numbers, I uh, just – it was hard to see. And so, you know – Unfortunate for for everyone involved, obviously, uh, including Iowa, who'd been playing really, really well, and I'm sure wanted to get that other, you know, that last game in. But you know, that's the thing, Mike, that we talked about back in August. Like this mm-hmm. was just going to happen. I mean, it was something that was you, know, you never knew. You know, you know, there was no promises, and you know, it's been a weird year, and um, you know, a tough one for everyone involved for sure. No, well, absolutely. I mean, Michigan became the only Big Ten team to cancel three games this season. Mm-hmm. You know, and as we we know, maybe it's surprising, maybe it's not. But going from zero positives, uh, or as far as we know, zero positives after six weeks to this, that is uh, truly amazing. It gives you a real, yeah. really good idea how fast this thing can spread. Yeah, yeah. Especially, I mean, in, in state, you know, we've had issues here as well. And, I mean, all it takes is a couple things. You know, if a couple people just, you know, don't, you know, maybe go about the exact thing you want that day in terms of, you know, you can't see this person, you can't see that person, and something happens, as you know, as you said, Mike. I mean, contact tracing and everything else can really get – that was the whole thing when the whole deal started was the ability to kind of put everyone inside, you know, their own world and mm-hmm. limit your contact tracing. And then when, you know, a holiday happens, Thanksgiving happens, and if families get involved, contact tracing just gets – really, really hard to uh, to counter or to uh, keep under control. And, you know, yeah, there you go. Well, there is a lot going on with Michigan football right now, and it's shaping up to be a really interesting off season and winter. But on Wednesday, uh, National Signing Day, we lost a couple of uh, recruits. Linebacker Brandon Jennings from Florida, Quentin Somerville, a defensive end from Arizona, flipped. But we secured Donovan Edwards and Xavier Worthy. So despite all of the drama around the program right now, Pretty darn good class, isn't it, Nick? Yeah, yeah. So it was a weird day, Mike. I'll <laughs> say yeah. that because you kind of said it at the top. Like, you know, they did lose, you know, two pretty, you know, highly touted players. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say that either Somerville or Jenny were the best players in the class or anything like that. But, I mean, they were both defensive players, you know, for a defense that needs a lot of help. Um, and, you know, I kind of looked at that as, you know, you only lost two guys that were committed, but you didn't need to lose any. Like, if you had this thing settled and if you had this thing signed, because that was, you know, reportedly those two kids left because there was no signature. And, and the rest of them took, you know, Jim Harbaugh at his word. And, you know, we'll see how that all pans out. But it certainly does feel like, Mike, looking at this offensively, all the guys offensively anyway um, seem to have a really good bond. I think that's the thing I would take away that, you know, I think that you give Michigan staff credit for making sure that, you know, people, you know, were well communicated to uh, as best you can, I suppose, because, you know, you got to remember the staffers don't know what Jim Harbaugh is going to do either. That's, you know, I mean, you can tell everybody the same thing, but it's not until it's official, it's not official. So you credit those guys for kind of working in chaos and and making sure that everything was as best as it could be to brace yourself for something that could have gotten out of control, but they were in a good spot with it. Uh, And I think most importantly, it seems that, you know, especially the kids offensively, um, you know, rallied around each other, all decided, you know, they want to be at Michigan. I think a lot of kids on both sides of the ball in this class probably saw this season and said, well, you know what, there's going to be opportunity to play next year because nobody out here did anything to, to hammer any job home. So I think that's, that's part of it, too. We've seen that before. It didn't get as toxic as it could have, I guess, and, and that's probably the takeaway. And I think that a credit for that would have to go to Michigan staff, but I think also to the kids because – I will say this. This has been a very hard year, obviously, for everyone involved, coaches, players, everything. But the recruits, too. I mean, they you know, they weren't able to take visits the way that they normally would get to. They weren't able to go around and have people come to their house. Uh, the relationship building just wasn't the same as it would be in a normal year. And they were kind of robbed of that, you know, due to COVID. And so I was, you know, I felt for everyone across the board in every class and every school everywhere, you know, you're signing in December because in some in some cases maybe – you know, you've been put in a spot where you're like, well, I got a spot here promised. I don't exactly know everything about what's going on here because I haven't had the ability to really scour or survey the uh, landscape like I would normally. But, you know, if you were comfortable with something, I think that you saw nationally this year people went with it. If you weren't, they rolled the dice. And it was it was going to be kind of a we'll see situation because of all the restrictions and everything else. But, you know, I think, yeah, you, you credit 
guys like uh, Giovanni Alati, they, they talked about being the first kid in the class and a kid that really worked hard to make sure that other kids wanted to come and play together. Uh, McCarthy, J.J. McCarthy doing the same thing and some other guys in there too, especially offensively because, you know, that did stick together. But, yeah, I, I would say overall not a really good, it's a good class. Uh, you'd like to see more on the defensive side though. And, it, it, I, you know, losing anybody at this situation in this spot really it kind of stings. And it just I didn't think it was necessary uh, when the day started. For the last six years, a lot of the uh, national recruiting analysts who talked about the fact that Michigan needs to step it up on the recruiting trail, maybe rethink yeah. the, the evaluation process. As we all know, winning would solve a lot of those issues, especially beating Ohio State. But clearly how Michigan is recruiting and maybe the type of kids uh, they are targeting needs to be reevaluated, which is not a bad thing, is it, Nick? No, not at all. I mean, you can't, you can't, the days of just, <clears throat> the days of uh, trying to come up with the reason or excuse why, you know, people being upset is over, you know, it's just not, that's got to go away. You were two and four. They were two and four. They were exposed. I know it's been a COVID year. You could, we're in a time now with football where you can create a narrative for anything you want, especially right now. And a lot of it would be justified, right? Because right. <clears throat> things are difficult. Things are tough. It, it's hard. But the more you do that and the less time you just stop and look at what you're doing and say, maybe that's what the problem is here uh, is wasted time in my opinion, because yeah, you're right, Mike. I mean, like, you know, I don't have the exact answer of, of what needs to be done here. I know a lot of people get hotter the collar about the Ohio thing about how they don't have enough, of a presence in Ohio, which is notable. I'm not going to say that it's not. I don't know if, you know, loading up in Ohio and just living in there would solve all the problems. You know, I don't I don't know that that would be the, the case. You know, Brady Hope was able to bring really good players in here during a time when Ohio State was under that, you know, Jim Trestle, Urban Meyer transition. Once Urban got things rock and rolling, that stopped. Uh, <laughs> that should be noted. That stopped. Brady did not uh, go into Ohio and just dominate his entire time there. He did it for two classes, and then Urban's put – put an end to that. Uh, so I'm not sure, you know, I, I think a lot of people fixate on geography and don't really understand what's happening. And I think a lot of times Michigan will take kids uh, defensively, especially that John Brown finds uh, that can be maybe labeled as projects, kids that are going to take a couple years, kids that aren't probably going to be ready immediately. Um, and you're not counterbalancing that enough anyway with kids that are ready right now. And defensively to find kids that are ready right now, that's the hardest thing to do. I feel like. Uh, in recruiting, especially up front, um, the defensive tackles, the linebackers, everything else, those are really hard. Those are premium players, cornerbacks who are ready to come in and play right now, premium player. They're not they're not getting those premium players uh, to sort of balance with the guys they're taking that are projects. Like Josh Uche was a project. Josh Uche worked out, but, you know, that's two and a half years that, you mm -hmm. know, after he signs that you just can't play him. And it works out in the end, and you maybe didn't even get all the, you know, and, and there's an argument there to be made, too, that you didn't get all that you could have necessarily in terms of playing time out of Josh. But, I mean, he's also a guy that wasn't ready till the end of his career. And so they've got a lot of guys in here like that. And, you know, that's the difference. Um, in 16 and 17, those early Jim Harbaugh classes, they signed a bunch of guys that were ready to play right away. They were ready to go. And they just aren't getting as many of those right now. I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, the, the wins and losses on the field. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, there's, they don't have, uh, Michigan staff does not have a reputation on the recruiting trail. And you can ask recruiting experts uh, as a, as a super aggressive staff, they just aren't. And that's just not their rep uh, <laughs> right or wrong. It's what it is. It's what's talked about. And so, yeah, there, there are things I think in terms of overall plan, organization, aggressiveness, what you're trying to do, where you're trying to go, and how you're trying to balance your roster that, you know, you need to be looked at to avoid situations where you're, you know, because we also can count into and say, you know, they need to recruit their own roster better, make sure they, you know, stop losing as many players off their own roster. And then what ends up happening there is the bottom of the class falls out because there's not enough to hold on, you know, and then you're just left with a bunch of guys who are still developing. So, yeah, I think a lot of that needs to be looked at hard uh, this offseason, one way or the other, and I, I assume it will be. And, um, you know, it's it's time. I mean, this recruiting staff here, for the most part, has been here since 2017. It's not like they're, you know, it's not like they were here for a hot second or one or two classes or whatever. It's been, what, two, three or four now. Mm -hmm. So I think, well, yeah, something like that. So 
yeah, I think it's it's fair to uh, fair to say that they should be uh, evaluated, and we'll see what happens. Well, this whole recruiting thing you mentioned Ohio, and that that's been talked about uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, why aren't we in Ohio more? There was a piece I think in the mm-hmm. Detroit News on Wednesday on why Michigan is not getting more kids from Ohio, and some of the big programs and coaches uh, down there say they don't even hear from Michigan anymore, which surprised me. I mean, given Michigan Michigan's success down there for decades, it's awfully hard to explain that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that there's partially – it's two things, you know. I, and I think, again, like I said, I think some of it gets overblown and some of it gets underblown. Like, you know what I mean? I think some, I think there's one side that says it doesn't matter, and there's and that's not true. And there's one side that says, you know, it's uh, we need to be in there and you know all the time. And I'm not sure if that's the answer either. But, you know, the, Ohio's a better recruiting foothold base, whatever you want to call it, than, than Michigan and has better high school football – you know, competition talent, you know, overall in terms of the entire state uh, year after year. And it is still, you know, uh, you know, a hotbed, I suppose. Uh, not maybe what it was in the 80s and 90s. Uh, people have moved, obviously. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's still, you know, it's still uh, a place where you would think you'd need to be. And it's a place where there's a lot of really good high school football programs that take high school football really seriously. And, you know, over the years, as I've watched – you know, players sort of come up, the guys who are ready faster are the kids that you find from places like that. They're kids. And there's a lot of schools in Ohio that are really, you know, kind of year round programs. I'm not sure if there's as many in Michigan. There are some like, you know, what Ron Bellamy has there, what they have at Belleville or at Cass Mm -hmm. or at King in Detroit. I mean, those are legit programs as well, but like there's more of them, I feel like in Ohio. And, and so, you know, you see other programs, like you'll see Mel Tucker get in there in Ohio and find some good players. I know you will. You'll see, You've seen what Cincinnati's been able to do. Um, Kentucky has built its program based on guys that maybe Ohio State doesn't quite want. And so the argument there is Michigan's not going to get any closer to Ohio State necessarily by being better in Ohio, but Michigan's not going to get into this situation, I would think, uh, by being better in Ohio. That is really the thing. You're not – the foundation of your class is the – the spine of them, you know, has been wobbly. The You can put the cherry on top of guys from all over the country if you want, but there's no – when you're haphazard with your geography and you're all over the place, you're finding kids that have a fit with you and everything else. But, I mean, are you finding kids that are familiar with your program? Are you finding kids that can come in and be leaders earlier in their careers? Or are you finding kids that are coming here and learning? And I know that that's not everything, but, like, proximity in some cases like this matters. I mean, these rivalries, you, know, you find a kid from Ohio that really wants it and is really good to come up here and he's going to fight pretty hard in those situations. Right. So, you know, we talked about with uh, Harbaugh's first couple teams, Jake, Butt, Taco Terrell and Chris Wormley, um, Ben Gideon, uh, all these guys from this, I think Ben was, you know, Demonte yeah. Thomas, I believe mm-hmm. was from Ohio, all these guys from Ohio that were really good football players that came up here and meshed really well with a bunch of kids from Detroit and it worked. That's, you know, Jim Harbaugh was from Ohio, is yeah. from Ohio, right? So that's the thing I think people look at and say, I'm used to seeing more of a spine, uh, you know, that's got a foothold in Ohio, Pennsylvania, in the Midwest, Midwestern kids that understand sort of what Michigan wants to be as a program, what they want to do, and you don't have to teach them. And I know that's not everything, obviously, but, you know, I can understand the argument on both sides. I really can. I think Michigan sh- should be better in Ohio than they are. Um there's no reason for it. Uh, you know, you can hire staffers who can go into Ohio and recruit if you can't do it yourself as a head coach. It's not something that should just be ignored. I don't think it is ignored, but it clearly isn't being emphasized enough. And, uh, you know, I think that that's something to address. I don't know if I would argue that needs that that's a reason to overhaul your entire operation. But, you know, yeah, it's definitely notable. And uh, I think something that should be addressed at some point here soon. Oh, absolutely. Okay, well, let's get your thoughts on the uh, the hot topic uh, now the recruiting's over, and that's the contract extension. Now the season is officially over also. Wouldn't you expect there will be some resolution pretty darn soon? Yeah, I would think. Um, you know, I don't know that for, for fact. Uh, that's, you know, that's always the thing is, you know, Jim, you know, is impossible to predict. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that for certain. You know, I, I would, though, expect, you know, now that the season's over, now that signing day is over, and I, you know, they do have, they still have to recruit. Obviously, they, the period actually doesn't close until Friday. But, um, you know, there there should be time and a window here in the next handful of days, uh, as we're uh, sitting here talking, Mike, on Thursday, um, for them to sit down and hash this out for Ward Ward Manuel and Jim Harbaugh to sit down and hash this out and come to a final decision. 
it's again, you know, it hasn't been, you know, we report, we've reported for weeks and months probably now. It hasn't been anyone's preference at Michigan to see this thing extend into 2021. Um, the only way that it would, only reason I can see that it would extend into 2021 would be Jim Harbaugh trying to continue to survey uh, the land of the NFL. And if I'm Michigan, I'm not letting that happen. I mean, like if he wants to do that and doesn't want to sign, then it's time to move on. I, and I think that, I think that that would be on the table. Uh, but you know, I'm not sure that it would, would happen either because it hasn't happened by now. So We'll see. Uh, I don't think it'll last forever. I mean, we could have resolution here before Christmas, or it could last until, you know, it could carry over. I don't know. It'll all depend on how, you know, quickly they can sort of come together and, and how quickly, really, at the end of the day, Mike, that Jim Harbaugh comes to the decision or conclusion on one of the two things. One, he believes he's supported and wanted here. Two, he believes he's not and isn't supported here. If he believes he's supported here, um, He'll sign whatever they put in front of him. I have no, you know, if, but if he doesn't and he thinks they're just sort of trying to pick between two pretty not ideal options, then I think Jim Harbaugh is going to make sure that he gets everything he can out of that deal because I don't think he's going to feel supported. And I'm not sure if that contract would do much to give you long term stability anyway. If people don't think that, you know, this is going to be a long term deal. So we'll see. That's, that's something I think they have to hash out. And I think on Jim's end, he has to hash out to Ward Manuel. What are you going to do to fix this? Because it's it needs to be fixed. There's a lot of things that need to be repaired here. Uh, you know, staffing decisions, philosophical, you know, uh, schematic, everything. I mean, everything needs to be evaluated. And so it needs to be a pretty big plan. And I think that that's also something that they need to sit down and talk about. And, and we'll sort of see. I mean, they've gotten through signing day. It could have been worse. It wasn't. Now we'll see how, you know, just sit down, get this thing fixed, figure it out one way or the other. So you can move forward with the kids on your team right now and they know what's going on. That's the most important thing. If Jim stays, extends his contract after year six, uh, a lot of folks think blowing up the staff seems like the thing that has to happen. Others, uh, you know, might say that's a sign of desperation. Brian Kelly pretty much did the same thing, though, and at Notre Dame, and it worked pretty well. But after a season like this, it sure seems like the program needs a jolt in some form or fashion, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, and I would say, Mike, I mean, uh, I don't know what, you know, people can have different des- uh, d- different definitions of desperation, but for me, this would be, you're, that's where that's where Michigan's at. If they bring Jim Harbaugh back, it's desperation time because it's fix- it's reset time. It's fix it. It's comeback time, whatever you want to call it, right? Like, <laughs> you're going to have to prove to us that you can turn this thing around because it went <clears throat> south and it didn't just go south this year. It had been slipping for the last couple of years and they have got to be honest with themselves in this moment. That is the most important thing is to be objective and honest with yourself about where you have been going as a program since the end of 2016. It hasn't been upward. It hasn't been stable. It has been, you know, with a couple of lips up in 2018, but more or less it's been on the downward slope. And so you got to be honest with yourself. And I really feel like sometimes Jim Harbaugh does a great job of that. And sometimes he does not do a good job of that. And that, you know, lately, I feel like the latter there, the not doing a good job of that has been more prevalent than the guy we saw early in his time at Michigan who would make decisions that needed to be made when they needed to be made, even if they were difficult. And now you're here again, and there's a lot more of them on the plate. And that's the ultimate question. I, I've been told this whole time, you know, from talking to folks that the Harbaugh is well aware of all this and, you know, is fully prepared to make change. Uh, you just don't know how sizable it would be and, and what all would happen. I, you know, I, I don't know how much we can read into, you know, even signing day, Mike, where you say mm-hmm. all the offensive kids were back, you know, is it possible Jim Harbaugh went to those kids and said, you know, I plan to be here and I plan to have Josh uh, Gaddis with me, you know, is that possible? Yeah. I mean, I think that seems like it's possible uh, given, you know, the fact that the class got sort of held together offensively, but defensively, no, yeah, you've got to do something different, um, you know, one way or the other, it's not working, obviously. Then nobody has any faith in the plan on the field. Nobody seems to have any on the sideline, not working. So, you know, you have to figure out something there too. And, um, you know, and like you said, Mike, the recruiting area as well, I think would be another one where you really got to look deep into. We've seen so many traditional power teams struggle this year, Nick. It's not yeah. just Michigan. Look at LSU, and hey, their recruiting classes are right up there every year, But and they are coming off a national championship. Struggled mightily. So when you look at what Michigan has right now coming back, and that could change uh, with the transfer portal, and then you factor in this recruiting class, does Michigan have enough talent on this roster to turn this thing around in a positive direction next season? 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that they, I think they probably have enough to be. I know they have enough to be better than this. That's the that's the situation that that I would say turn it around. Though I, you know, like I don't know if they have enough to have a great great year. I don't know if they have enough to be a ten or eleven win team. You know, but I, I think they have enough to be better than this. And I'm not sure what people want or believe Jim Harbaugh needs to give them one way or the other on that. I suppose that would be subjective. But really, the thing that's been super concerning here to me this year. Um, obviously, you know, when you get, when you have injuries, it exposes your depth and your lack of depth. And that's what happened here. But more than that, like the, the disconnect between, you know, player and the the kids just looked like they didn't have any faith in anything that was being, you know, implemented on the field zero. And other than, you know, maybe a handful of kids, but I mean, by and large, what you saw out there was a bunch of kids who just looked lost. And Mm -hmm. that was alarming alarming in, in, in many of those games. And that is, that is why, you know, I think a lot of people are in this, you know, maybe it's time to move on here and, you know, uh, and have been for, for several weeks and maybe months, because that's alarming. That's not something that, you know, you can just chalk up to like, well, I mean, maybe you can, maybe it's all things, all things, right. It's, you know, it, you know, the COVID stuff having to grind through all this, everybody got wore out one or the other, but man, one way or the other, that's got to get fixed. And there's got there's some disconnect there between Jim and the roster because they're not, you know, the, they weren't able to hang in there. They just weren't able to, you know, trust confidence in what they were being taught. Uh, obviously, it just didn't it just didn't work. Mm-hmm. And injuries obviously play a role in that. But you know, that's the thing when you talk about it. Like Jim's got to look at this really hard. Everything. Every, Urban Myers talked about it on TV several times. You know, it's not necessarily about just firing everybody and, and starting over. Uh, as much as it is, because if you do that, that's great. But you, if you have the same problems, you know what I mean? Like that's not going to fix anything. So, you know, the guy at the top has to be the guy who fixes all that. If he's still here and you know, that's, that's on Jim to do that. And that's, I don't know what that looks like, but you know, it's, it's become pretty obvious that, you know, when things are getting difficult or things get challenging for these teams, last couple of years, we've seen this, you know, they go South very fast and it doesn't, they don't hang in there. They don't roll with the punches. They don't sort of just, you know, okay, that was a rough quarter. Let's bounce back here and see what happens. Like, no, it's like that was a rough quarter, and now that's a nosedive. And, you know, that's really alarming, and that's stuff that is hard to ignore and hard to unsee. And that's the stuff that is in front of Jim Harbaugh now that he has to make people unsee uh, by, if he is back, having what I would argue would be probably the best coaching job that he's done, certainly here and maybe maybe anywhere, because I think that that's what's in front of him here. This is uh, This was not a – accidental dip this was a a situation that had gotten you know sort of rusted out and needs to be fixed and that's that's the deal the good thing i guess if you're looking at it from michigan's point of view would be that that's jim arbaugh's strength he's never had to fix his own mess before but he has been good over the years at fixing messes usually uh, created by someone else but still (laughs) harder to fix your own but not impossible and i suppose we'll see we'll see how it goes no we sure will so in the coming weeks and months it will be interesting to watch if jim stays how he implements change and that will give us a lot to talk about during the winter months this saturday though uh, nick northwestern Mm -hmm. and ohio state meet in the big 10 championship game it's a 12 noon kickoff you know i love pat fitzgerald i love what he does with that program gets the most out of his talent everyone has to realize that yeah that said, I cannot see them hanging around along with Ohio State. Can you? No, no. Uh, I mean, I said that a couple <laughs> years ago, and they gave them more of a game yeah. than I thought they would, even though that you know, and they played hard. And I would expect that is probably what we'll see. I, I would, I would expect them to fight really hard, uh, and probably you know, maybe even give them more of a fight than I'm probably giving them credit for. But in terms of talent, no. I mean, it's not, it's not even close. I mean, I don't know what Ohio State's at right now. I mean, when they played Michigan State, they were down a bunch of guys you know, to a point where it was questionable, maybe whether or not they, yeah, they seemed like they were right on the line uh, in terms. So they had, they had a lot of work to do there in terms of getting guys out of quarantine and everything else. So we'll see where they're at uh, with that. But, you know, I mean, Ohio state's offensive line is incredible. Ohio state's defense is completely loaded. Justin Fields is the best player in the big 10 night and close. Um, it would be a pretty big, I would, you know, I think selfishly, I would, I would have liked to see Iowa uh, mm-hmm. against Ohio State. I think that that maybe would have been a better game. But also, you have to say that, well, Northwestern beat Iowa, and I know that it was early in the year, but that's kind of what Northwestern does. So, you know, <laughs> they they do a really good job of taking advantage of your mistakes. But at some point in every game, they have to be able to make plays when you start making plays, and that's 
sort of the formula when they play teams of this uh, of this caliber. They they fight with them for a while, and then you know the talent wins out. And I, I assume that'll be what we see uh, there on Saturday. And um, you know I think anything else would be probably pretty surprising, maybe borderline on shocking if, if Northwestern pulled that off. But that <laughs> seems like Ohio State's game to lose. Yeah. Well, the playoff teams are going to be decided after this weekend. It's championship weekend. Let's just say it's Alabama, Clemson, Notre Dame, and Ohio State. Who do you like yeah. to win it out of that group? I mean, probably Alabama. I wouldn't rule out Clemson. I think Alabama and Clemson are clearly the best, it seems like, anyway. Ohio State's been tougher to gauge because uh, they haven't played as much, and they did struggle a little bit with Indiana, but I, I really liked Indiana uh, this year. I thought Indiana was a lot better than people probably realize. Notre Dame, uh, like, I like Notre Dame, and I think in this scenario, given all the uncertainty, they have seemed to be able to hold together pretty well. They, they, I feel like they have probably good leaders on that team. Uh, play, play really hard. I don't think Notre Dame's talent level is quite at, you know, the Alabama or Ohio State level. They did beat Clemson, but I believe Lawrence was out during that game. Mm-hmm. So was he out during that game? He was. He did, he, yeah. did, so, he did not play. The freshman backup play. Yeah, right. So, you know, that's that has to be taken into account here, too. I mean, Notre Dame would probably be on the bottom end of that in terms of talent based on what we know. Uh, who's on those rosters. But, I mean, I've watched Alabama a few times this year, Mike. Their offensive line is insane. Yeah. If you had to give the Heisman to anybody, it would be Devonta Smith at Alabama or Alabama's offensive line. Those would be my vote for Heisman because they have just steamrolled through everyone they've played. And Clemson has had some COVID issues, I think, that have gotten in the way, and we'll see about all that. Lawrence is an equalizer. But I would say Alabama would probably be my pick. Uh, Alabama, Clemson in the final. I would, I would probably pick Alabama to win that. Well, a final question, Nick, before we let you get away, and this is one I get a lot from my listeners. And you know, as the season ends and we look forward to what happens next, uh, it, it's something I think about, and, and I like to tell my listeners this: you know, Michigan football has not been elite for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, good most years, and then very good every so often. Sort of like Notre Dame. Are the glory days? Do you think behind this program or is it still possible for Michigan and Jim Harbaugh to really reinvent themselves and compete at an elite level in the coming years, at least every so often? Yeah, oh yeah, I think it's possible for Michigan, you know, whether it be with Jim Harbaugh or anybody, um, to, like you said though, reinvent yourself and, you know, reinvent the program. Because that's it, Mike. That's what that's what this is. The, the glory days, yes, they're done. Like, that's over. The lineage and the, you know, the thing, the Schimbeckler to Lloyd Carr. I mean, that the Lloyd Carr, Lloyd Carr retired in 2007. So, like, people, I think, have had a hard time remembering, like, time has passed. Yeah. And Michigan has not carried that through. It has not been a blip. It has not been one or two years. It has been more than a decade. So, those days are gone. Um, you know, if you, you can bring people back into your program that have familiarity with it and can sort of, you know, appreciate your traditions and appreciate the way you go about doing business. But, you know, by and large, no, I mean, the program, you know, and then I I would argue that it has been, I don't think Jim Harbaugh has made decisions based on what's happened here in the past. I don't think that's been his, his bag this tenure, but I mean, going forward, you know, yeah, no, but Michigan has the resources to do it. They have, you know, the profile to do it. They have the brand to do it uh, in terms of being able to recruit nationally. I mean, you saw that yesterday. That should be as much of a sign of anything yesterday. I mean, Michigan's Michigan. People still, you know, some kids still want to come here for the school and everything else, and that's still carrying uh, weight. So uh, I think that what you said, Mike, getting into a situation where you're competing with and maybe giving yourself a chance uh, every couple of years against Ohio State, uh, although if they're going to be a behemoth like this, uh, I don't know you know, how long that lasts. Mm-hmm. If they're going to be this good for that long, maybe they will be. Um, maybe they'll you know, settle back in and we'll, and we'll see situations again at some point sooner than later where Ohio State, you know, Maybe once in a while has a ten and two season and isn't awesome every single time. So it's possible, I guess. But I think Ohio State would have to dip a little bit, but it's not impossible. And and I think the the takeaway for me is, especially the last two years and then the way they finished in eighteen, they're better. They could be better than that. That's what I would say. They can be better than what we saw in nineteen. They had better talent than what the record showed. Uh, The season completely fell apart in twenty eighteen. That that's not really acceptable either. Uh, this year, obviously not acceptable. They're they're better than this for sure. And when you look look at the early first couple of years of Harbaugh, where they were pushing, 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 didn't quite have enough, but we're right there. That's really where the program I think should be living. And you know that's not impossible. We've seen that, and I think that that's that's probably you know a fair 
you know, you should be in that spot. You can have a bad one or a rough one once in a while. The wheels can't fall off, though, and you have to win some of those red-letter games when you have them on the hook, and, and that's been the difference. But they can be better than this, for sure. And um, I think that's the thing I would tell people is that, you know, glory days are all, you know, the, the you look back on them with, you know, uh, fondness in your eyes probably and everything else, but you also have to remember – They've won one national championship since, what, the 50s or mm-hmm. 40s or whatever it was? Mm-hmm. One. Not 10, not two, but <laughs> one. So, like, people who think they should just be in this national whatever every single time, I, it's just never happened here. So, like, I don't know why that's something that I can I can see that as a wish list, but an expectation, no. That's, that's, that's just not realistic. So, But better than this, yes, and I think that that's – that's definitely possible. I think it should even be expected because this is not good enough, and I think everyone would agree with that. Absolutely. With us on our uh, game day segment this week has been Nick Baumgartner from The Athletic. Nick, always a pleasure to uh, have you on Talking Michigan Football. It's going to be a very busy winter, so I'm sure after the new year we'll uh, we'll get you back on and see what's happening uh, with Jim Harbaugh and the program if Jim's here. So until then, you take care of yourself. Uh, have a very Merry Christmas, and we look forward to that next visit in the new year. Outstanding. Sounds good. Same to you, Mike. So it should be an interesting few weeks as we wait for a determination on Jim's contract and what happens after he resigns or even decides to pursue other options. We will, of course, have the latest for you on next week's show. Now that football season is officially over, at least for us, we will return to our regular schedule of one show a week. Unless there is breaking football news this week, I think we'll start paying attention to basketball. Jawan Howard's team is off to a 6-0 and start, with games coming up on Christmas Day and New Year's Eve. It looks like it could be a very exciting winter for hoops and hockey, but they will also be dealing with the same COVID issues all season long. So make sure you join us next week. That does it for another show. Thanks for joining me, and please tell your family and friends about the Michigan Man Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Until we meet again, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man, here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at Yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at Yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go blue.